from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day, a big thaw in the trade war with China, both sides announcing an agreement. Uh, this is a very large deal, the China deal. But questions remain. Well, that's why I and others are skeptical here. And what a deal could mean for farmers in the future. Let's hope we have something with China. We do need them as uh, they're great. They have been a great customer. Team coverage starts now. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado and the all new Silverado HD the strongest, most advanced family of Silverados ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. We have lots to get to this morning after the announcement that the U.S. and China have agreed to a phase one trade deal. Here's the latest on what we know. The U.S. trade representative saying the two sides have reached an historic and enforceable agreement on the phase one deal. It says the deal requires structural reforms and other changes in the areas of intellectual property, technology transfer, agriculture, financial services, and currency, and foreign exchange. Officials say the agreement also includes a commitment by China that it will make substantial additional purchases of U.S. goods and services in the coming years. Now, as part of the agreement, the president canceled tariffs that were due to go in place on Sunday. The president also saying there will be a 50% cut in the tariffs he put in place Back in September, those tariffs will go from 15% to 7.5%. But the 25% tariffs on $250 billion worth of goods he imposed last year will remain. Both sides still need to sign the agreement, which Reuters is reporting will be signed the first week of January. President Trump taking to Twitter to talk about the deal, saying, quote, we have agreed to a very large phase one deal with China. They have agreed to many structural changes and massive purchases of agricultural product, energy, and manufactured goods, plus much more. Going on to say, we will begin negotiations on the phase two deal immediately, rather than waiting until after the 2020 election. This is an amazing deal for all. Thank you, end quote. Also speaking about it at the White House. Uh, this is a very large deal, the China deal. It covers tremendous manufacturing, farming, uh, a lot of rules, regulations. A lot of things are covered. It's a phase one deal, but a lot of big things are covered. And I say affectionately, the farmers are going to have to go out and buy much larger tractors because it means a lot of business. As for U.S. ag purchases, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer also talking with reporters at the White House, saying China committed to purchase $16 billion in U.S. ag goods in the first year and that the purchases would be $32 billion of additional products over two years. However, he also commented that China said they would make efforts to get to $50 billion in ag purchases. And he says it would increase total U.S. trade to China by $200 billion over a two-year period. Now, here's what the president had to say when he was asked about it. I think they'll hit $50 billion in agriculture. No, much more than 50, because it's also manufacturing and other. But I think in agriculture, they will hit $50 billion. Yes. More comments from top trade officials about the deal, including U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer. Quote, President Trump has focused on concluding a phase one agreement that achieves meaningful, fully enforceable structural changes and begins rebalancing the U.S.-China trade relationship. This unprecedented agreement accomplishes those very significant goals and would not have been possible without the president's strong leadership, end quote. Also playing an integral role in the trade talks, U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin commenting, quote, today's announcement of a phase one agreement with China is another significant step forward in advancing President Trump's economic agenda. Thanks to the president's leadership, this landmark agreement marks critical progress toward a more balanced trade relationship and a more level playing field for American workers and companies, end quote. Chinese officials holding a news conference on Friday to talk about the deal, saying major progress was achieved on the first phase of trade discussions, adding the U.S. would follow up on its promise to cancel tariffs on a phased basis. Officials didn't lay out specific numbers when it comes to U.S. ag, but said the country planned to import more U.S. wheat, corn, rice, and cotton after the deal is signed. Markets and social media, of course, reacting to the news as details continue to flow in. Farm Journal Washington correspondent Jim Wiesmeyer also weighing in, but taking a wait and see attitude on any agreement in principle. We had an agreement in principle on October the 11th per President Trump in an Oval Office video. 
And he, all he said at that time was we had to paper it, meaning they had to put words on paper. We're basically back to that same development. So that's why I and others are skeptical here. This is good news relative to the Chinese press conference uh, you know, today uh, saying that there's an agreement in concept, but that doesn't mean specifics. And I think that's what the you know, market needs right now. Well, we continue to watch this thing, and I think the market is waiting for some sort of specifics. I know the president uh, just a few moments ago came out and said, hey, we're talking $50 billion with a B of agricultural purchases. But again, it's not written down anywhere. We don't see anything signed. So until I guess we see that, right, it, it, it's fair to wait. Until we see it in text or... Uh, if we hear it from a Chinese official publicly, like at their press event, you know, today, in which they were very vague on the commitments. In fact, they said it basically had to be market oriented, so, you know, supply driven, demand driven, etc. We'll have more reaction from Jim coming up in analysis. Ag Day national reporter Betsy Jibben talking with farmers about the deal. She spoke with a producer in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. She says as a soybean grower, we really need China, but she says even with a deal, she's still concerned. I'm very worried at what we've done to destroy the relationship we have with China. Even if we get the tariffs off and we get trade going again, I think it will be difficult to ever get to the level of trade that we had with them and that level of trust, not just for China, but the whole world, because really the whole world is watching what we're doing. And we're going to have much more on the U.S.-China Phase 1 agreement coming up. The market's going on a wild ride on Friday on the trade news. We'll have the numbers and reaction, plus more from Farm Journal's Jim Wiesmeyer on what happens next. Stay with us for continuing coverage. We also have much more on the story posted on agweb.com. We are also tracking some big weather developments with a storm system moving across the entire country right now. Let's get the latest from meteorologist Mike Hoffman. Yeah, that's right, Clinton. We are going to watch a, a storm system. It's right out ahead of the trough in the middle of the country, and it's going to be spreading east. I don't see anything major out of that. Uh, we might get a decent amount along the east coast, but then look what happens. We actually have another storm system, the trough coming into the west coast as we head through the middle of the week, and that's a little bit of a change from what we have been seeing. Uh, here's something worth celebrating. Finally, the end of Harvest 19. Erin Holbert of Central Indiana sharing this picture after she finally put Harvest in the books. You can just see the relief on her face. I'll have more on your forecast coming up in just a little while. Coming up, we continue our discussion on the U.S.-China trade deal, what we know, what we don't. And later, while picking the perfect Christmas tree, maybe a little harder this year. As we go to break, more reaction to the U.S.-China Phase 1 trade deal, this statement from NCBA. Ag Day, brought to you by Precision Planting, provider of practical and effective precision ag technologies to help make farmers smarter every season. Learn more at precisionplanting.com. A big rally for commodities to end the week after the U.S.-China trade deal was announced, but what will the market be looking for this week? We have an update from this evening. Today in the grain market, soybeans jumped up. That China deal is getting closer. The news says that a deal is really at hand, and but nothing is signed yet, but the markets are reacting uh, very well. Corn also is on the rise. Now, Mexico did make a big purchase, and it really uh, got the market rolling, of course, with the, with the idea that the tariff war is uh, really coming to an end. Sparked a nice rally, but the market started to slide back down a little bit. Wheat was lower today. That export commitment forecast uh, uh, really fell a little bit and it certainly looks like uh, we're at uh, at the 65 percent versus 70 percent for the five-year average that's uh, something to say about wheat and that may start to weigh on the market a lot cattle had new highs that world demand is definitely on the rise more beef is headed to china and pushing futures up and out of the channel that it's been
been in for a while. Tight supplies are ahead. That really is driving the market a little bit higher. Feeders did also jump up. The packer interest is steady to firm and kind of pushing that market higher. Hogs were higher, but just certainly not as much. The trade details are uh, scarce right now, and that has some of the traders wringing their hands. Volatility is definitely ahead. Once we find out the details about the trade deal, I think that uh, that's going to dictate the direction come Monday morning. More now in my discussion with Farm Journal's Jim Wiesmeyer about the U.S.-China Phase 1 trade deal. Now, I spoke with him as news broke from the Ag Day newsroom about these very public negotiations and the timeline for the whole process. I think both countries are negotiating publicly in this. We're being spun. Mm. And I hate to say it, I, I can't trust U.S. officials in on this topic because we've been burned too many times with lack of follow through. And as far as China, I, I mean, I have to see the commitments from China because they've been more circumspect on, on this one. Again, I hate to say it, but uh, we've been burned before. So I don't care what Trump is saying on the $50 billion, verify it with text and verify it with the Chinese officials' comments. And if that's the case, let's get on with it. Have we heard a timeline on even this phase one signing? Okay, first, uh, the timeline on phase one would be if they, <laughs> you, first you have to have an overall agreement. Now, some of people say that the, some a USTR and a Chinese official could sign it yet today. How can you sign an agreement that's in concept without it being legally written? You know, we're back to the paper it thing mm -hmm. again. So I'm confused there. As far as timeline on phase one, it's murky. It's up in the air. I, no one knows. Uh, as far as phase two or maybe even perhaps a phase three, I'll guarantee you it won't be early in 2020 if, if in 2020. I think Trump has decided. Remember, he talks out loud a lot. And uh, in some of his varying comments, uh, it's his true position. And a few weeks ago, he said, you know, I think I might not want to conclude this agreement with China until after 2020 elections. I would take that timeline for even if we can get to a phase two agreement because China, they're dragging their feet on phase one. Can you imagine getting them to sign the bottom line on the more sensitive issues of phase two? Thanks, Jim. Wheat organizations also commenting on the phase one trade deal with China, saying they're also encouraged by the news about the deal. You can see their comments on your screen. We'll have more on your weather next. Just Mike Hoffman uh, joining us here to take a look at overall rainfall over the past week. And Mike, there there is rainfall and moisture on the map here, but not like we've seen this year. No, and I, I kind of keep thinking with the Arctic air in the northern states and the very warm, humid air to the south, you'd get some big storm systems out of it, but we just haven't so far. Now, we do have a couple of systems moving from west to east across the country this week, but uh, neither one of them look like they're going to put down huge amounts of moisture, and we really didn't see any last week either. This takes us from a week ago Saturday through this past Friday, and you can see the middle of the country just didn't get much at all. And in fact, even in the heavier areas, you're talking one to two inch amounts, uh, eastern Tennessee Valley, uh, many parts of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, those areas. But it just wasn't a widespread event. And you look out west, well, there's been some finally, and these are drought areas, so that's not bad news at all. Western Washington, Western Oregon, and the northern portions of California. Now, the root zone moisture continues to show wet conditions, although this has backed off a little bit because of all the dryness we've been seeing. From the Great Lakes into the northern Rockies and down into the central plains, still on the dry side for the root zone, southeast, southern and central Texas, <clears throat> and of course the Pacific Northwest, especially those areas that have gotten moisture and we have another system coming in. So that could help you folks out. Longer term then, the drought monitor is still the worst case is the uh, Four Corner region. Otherwise it's just spotty areas in Texas and a few lingering spots in the southeast. There's that storm system. Not a strong one, but nonetheless, it is moving off to the east. You can see how uh, this is going to be a shot of very cold air once again, Arctic air for the Great Lakes into the northeast as we head through the middle of the week. There's that next system. Kind of weakens as it comes into the ridge, but it holds together as we head through uh, next weekend. So uh, that could be an interesting setup before Christmas as well here. It might warm up 
uh, in the middle of the country, but this could be a storm system that causes issues as we head toward Christmas. We'll be watching that for you. Temperatures this week below normal eastern half of the country, basically above normal western third. Precipitation this week, uh, lots of the middle and western, northwestern portions of the country below normal. I'm going above normal for that one system coming into California and also in the far southeast. 30 day outlook for temperatures below normal central mountains and the northern tier of states above normal southeast and uh, southern Texas. 30 day outlook for precipitation. I'm going to kind of go above normal in the middle of the country there from coast to coast. Battle between the cold and the warm below normal southern Texas and much of Florida. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. We head to Bakersfield, California. First of all, partly sunny and chilly, high temperature of 56. Fargo, North Dakota, very cold with clouds and sunshine, high of 7. And Atlanta, Georgia, mostly cloudy and mild. Could be a shower, especially late in the day, high 65. Still ahead, the latest on a Christmas tree shortage across the country. And if you want a used combine under the Christmas tree, Machinery Pete says you may have to pay. Details next. And the U.S. Meat Export Federation issuing this statement on the phase one trade deal with China, saying China is the world's largest and fastest growing destination for imported red meat. And they're excited about the prospects for expanded opportunities. We'll be right back. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. Who wouldn't want a good used combine under the Christmas tree this year? Machinery Pete lets you know what you might have to pay. Hey folks, Machinery Pete here reporting to you on the road this week. And I tell you, what a week it was for used combine values. The week got started off last Saturday on a farm auction in West Central Indiana where this 2011 John Deere 9770 STS, 981 engine hours on it, sold for $175,000. Now, folks, that's the highest auction price this year on a 9770 by $31,000. Now, things continued last Tuesday, farm auction in West Central Ohio, where this Case H 2588, 1154 engine hours, this thing's about 10, 11 years old, sold for $112,000. And that is the second highest auction price on a 2588 in four years. Now, also last Tuesday, on a farm auction in Northwest Ohio, we filmed for our Machine Repeat TV show, this 2013 Case H 7230 combine with 1,016 engine hours on it sold for $166,000, highest auction price this year on a 7230. Now, last Thursday, farm auction Southwest Indiana, this 2011 John Deere 9870 STS, 1,724 engine hours on it went for $130,000, second highest auction price this year on a 9870. And the kicker, folks, uh, also last Thursday, online auction in central Minnesota, this 2018 John Deere S790 track combine, 354 engine hours on it, sold for $396,000. That is the highest auction price I have ever seen on a combine. Coming up, still searching for the perfect Christmas tree? Why well, the search may be a little tougher this year, next in the country. Machine Repeats having a year-end unreserved online dealer auction in conjunction with Big Iron. Items are open for bidding now and close December 27th. Start bidding now at machinerypeat.com slash auction. The Christmas tree industry is pushing hard to finish strong this holiday season. For America's many growers, this is what they've been waiting for most times for at least a decade. But that long timeline is causing a few issues this season. Ask Larry Smith when he plans to retire and he'll say never. The Christmas tree grower has been selling Fraser firs in the same lot in Lenore, North Carolina for 40 years. He got into the Christmas tree business while he was a senior in high school. And back when the Tar Heel State provided a mere 1% of the nation's supply, 40 years later, North Carolina Fraser firs make up 25% of the Christmas tree market. And for Smith, business is better than ever. Christmas tree quantities are tight again this year across the country. 10 years ago, during the Great Recession, an oversupply of trees caused a domino effect. Less trees sold meant fewer trees planted. Those would have been harvested this year. Now Smith says it's his best year ever. About eight years ago, when the recession was here, the farmers weren't selling all of their trees, so they weren't allowed 
the resetting fields that they normally would. A lot of the farmers has gotten older and their kids realize that there's an easier way to life. I mean, it's, it's a pretty manually intense pro product that we grow, you know. I enjoy being outdoors, working, you know, in nature. And also it's, you know, the product that you're producing is gonna be enjoyed by families and you hopefully will make fond memories during the holiday season. He says the shortage can also be blamed on hot weather, but he doesn't predict running out when supplies on his lot dwindle. His team heads up the mountain to harvest more from their Avery County farm. So hard work, Smith says, is all well worth it at Christmas. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.